one. Hi everyone, my name is CMAC and welcome to another ASIC webinar series, um, Australian chapter, Australasian chapter of the Geosynthetics uh, Society, International Geosynthetics Society. This is our webinar number 21. Um, so we started in 2019 had, uh, having our 21st webinar today, uh, 16th of June, 2021 in Australia. And I think it's uh, evening in uh, the US for George Kerry, who's uh, our guest today. So I take you through this intro introduction slides quickly. As you know, Australasian chapter covers Australia, New Zealand, um, PNG and uh, Pacific Islands, so we are one of the uh, more than 45 chapters of the IGS, the International Geosynthetic Society. This is the website of the IGS, uh, geosyntheticsociety.org, and um, as a, an ASICS member or Australian chapter member, you can access all of the uh, technical resources and, um, and uh, participate in the events that the IGS organizes. This one is the uh, ASICS website, acigs.org. And as you can see, we have a lot of resources available on our website. Um, a lot of events, so you can access to all of the events information on our website. And also we put recordings of all of our lectures and webinars and online sessions, um, as well as the in-person sessions that we have um, recorded, the, the video recorded. So you can access all of those from our website. At the end of this event, if you need uh, a certificate of attendance, you can just email uh, info at asics.org and we can organize a certificate to be sent to you. And uh, thanks to the event's sponsor, uh, today's webinar, we have three sponsors today. So platinum sponsor is Staptec, uh, the gold sponsor is Colotons Axter, and the venue sponsor, uh, including um, the morning tea and lunch, is uh, TRI Australasia. So, thank you to all three sponsors of this event Fabtech, Colotons Axter, and TRI Australasia. And uh, the topic today is about geosynthetics durability. Uh, George, I know you, your topic might be, might have a little. Uh, more words into in the actual title, um, but um, George Kernet is well known in the geosynthetics industry, and uh, we are very uh, pleased to have George here in our event today. Uh, just a very brief introduction of George. Um, George Kernet, his interest in geosynthetics spans his entire professional life, from undergraduate work in the 1980s <coughs> to the present. George was born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and has gained a bachelor in 1985, master's degree in 1987, and PhD in 1993 in civil, architectural, and environmental engineering at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Between his bachelor's and uh, master's degree, he worked for uh, Chernobyl Foundation and SNME. He's a professional engineer in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and is an ASQC quality auditor. George's master's thesis was on direct shear testing on geosynthetics interfaces, and his doctoral dissertation was on landfill leachate plugging of soil and geosynthetic filters. Both are regularly cited to this day. Beginning as a research assistant, then research associate in the Geosynthetics Research Institute, his task progress into assistant director, associate director, and director designate, and director of the Geosynthetics Institute. During these 30 plus years of geosynthetics activities, Dr. Kerner's output has been tremendous. For example, he has, he, he has to his uh, credit numerous publications, just to name a few books edited and co-edited, uh, 15 of those uh, journal papers, 18, symposium and conference publications, 40, book chapters and published reports for and miscellaneous articles 30. So I hope these are correct numbers, George. Uh, I know there must be a lot more than this, uh, but just as a very brief uh, interview, I just picked this from your uh, GSI website. Thank you. And uh, without wasting any time, we just go to George and uh, his presentation.
I hope you can see it. It's an honor and privilege to be with you. Thank you so much uh, for the lovely introduction. Uh, the presentation today will uh, be outlined like this. I, I was asked to uh, critique your very interesting geomembrane durability forum, and I'll do that in one slide. Um, manufacturing of polyethylene geomembranes and then talk about durability subsequently talk about lifetime prediction and then give you some uh, summary observations. But uh, this is where I'm going from. And, and please ask questions. Uh, we're going to save that for the end. But uh, it's all important and especially to uh, extend the technology. This forum uh, was very nice. Uh, five speakers, all well, very well known. Uh, I know most of them, uh, even personally. Uh, Eric Blonde, uh, a consultant uh, now, but uh, worked for a huge uh, geosynthetic laboratory, Sageos in Canada, and then for Solmax for a while. Eric would like to uh, have the OIT values in GRI GM13, uh, minimum average values and not retained values. In addition, all homogenized in plaque before uh, running the test. And this is to get any variability out. Eric presented some data that uh, showed the coefficient of variation for the two tests. Standard OIT is in the single digits. High pressure OIT is in the double digits. And he thinks he can get both of them tighter um, with, with, with some sample preparation. Really uh, nice uh, comments from him. I, I, I believe Fred is rightfully angry over past failures that has been experienced. Uh, believes there's no direct correlation between OIT test results and in-situ field performance. Uh, certainly thinks that stress cracking is equally or maybe more important than uh, of an endurance property than either standard or high pressure I OIT. And uh, I think all of this is founded with uh, field case histories I think he's uh, right on target and uh, was interesting to hear him speak. Um, Boyd Ramsey is the optimist of the group. Um, he has probably the most manufacturing experience, I would say, of the group of five. Um, he positioned out that geomembrane formulations are closely guarded secrets. Uh, geomembrane manufacturing, he thinks, is ever improving. Uh, with better equipment, better controls. And I, I think what Boyd was hinting at was uh, the, the extruder mixes better. And also there are screens in there now that, uh, that, that clean things up so that foreign particles aren't in there. He said very clearly that the two OIT tests are different tests intended for different AO package or antioxidant packages. And he really said that you need to be an educated consumer. If you're, uh, you're, you're buying commodity uh, geomembranes with uh, K306 and Ergonox 1010 uh, as a stabilization package, that, 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 that's a different material than some of these hybrid materials. And I think he made that very clear. Warren was, was terrific. Uh, used an accredited laboratory and believes that we're, we're testing very small samples and not enough of them. Uh, I think he said that, you know, the sample is, the specimen in an OIT test is the size of a rice kernel. Uh, my favorite comment about the forum, if you get a negative test result, there's no retest. Uh, Warren, it would nice. It would be nice to be you and be king. I, uh, I I love that comment. I don't know how that will play internationally, but uh, it it was fantastic and very heartfelt. Um, Professor Rowe was interesting. He thinks the relationship between OIT and performance is quite elusive. He showed a, a bunch of case histories where that was not the case, and uh, interesting. He thinks we certainly need a more rigorous durability challenge beyond oven aging and UV fluorescent tests uh, for extreme applications. So I, I think uh, Ryan asked, can you cull your 
uh, five slides down to one. That's the best I could do for you, Ryan. I, uh, I, I tried to make it as uh, condensed as I possibly could, but a very nice uh, forum. And I think it launches well into this one. Um, I have to say that uh, you need to have a quality of system approach with uh, waste containment. This is typically the seven prong approach, which is outlined here. Please realize the form and specifically this is only gonna address this specified uh, quality material, which I'm obviously talking about geosynthetics and in this particular case, mainly geomembranes. But there is a, a, a procedure here, a good design, um, accredited testing, best available installation, quality inspectors, uh, performance tests before commissioning the facility, and then operation and maintenance. I was challenged at a previous uh, speaking engagement, which one is the most important? It's not that sort of play. Uh, it's all important and probably the the weakest link in this will probably be your misgiving or your un, undoing, so to speak, for the project. So we're gonna talk specifically uh, about quality materials and uh, I'll walk you through what I have prepared. I, I love this flow diagram. It's by a dear friend, Henry Haxo, back in the, uh, the 80s. But uh, manufacturing of geomembranes is leading down one of these three paths. Uh, the path that we're most interesting is that extrusion on the left-hand side uh, goes from the polymer to the extrusion to non-reinforced uh, fabrication panel and then installation. But uh, that's the avenue that we're going on. Uh, I, I think this is telling. Uh, please realize that over 100 million tons of polyethylene is being produced annually around the world. It represents about 34% of uh, the, the polymer market. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about the origin of the monomer, the ethylene, the process temperature, the reaction pressure, and the catalyst, whether it be aluminum or titanium. Uh, folks, this is uh, the purview of uh, chemists and uh, chemical engineers. Uh, in no way uh, would a civil engineer uh, venture into this. I'm interested in your end product. Uh, it, it's mostly hearsay uh, that uh, of the variations of these different plants. It's the major uh, players or the petrochemical industry. Uh, please realize this polymerization, the initiation, propagation, termination is uh, all controlled. Uh, please re also realize the reactor is producing a fluff and this fluff then uh, is converted into pellet with a, a whisper of an AO package. Um, I, I've been to a bunch of commencements lately and uh, they, they always reference the YouTube videos. There are some fantastic YouTube videos on this if you wanna get into the weeds of this, uh, much, more, much better than what I could uh, present here, but please note that that's available to you. Uh, the common geosynthetic polymers, we're going to talk about the olefins. We're at the top of this table, uh, polyethylene in particular, but realize polypropylene is not that much different in this regard. Um, the formulation is a recipe, and this recipe is ever-changing. Uh, HDPE linear low density in the neighborhood of 95% or greater of the resin, very little plasticizers or fillers. The carbon black is in there, two to three percent, and then the additive package, which is uh, all important. Um, Warren's comment of a three milligram rice crystal, uh, a rice kernel. That's what this is. That's what the pellet is. It's uh, in the neighborhood of three to five milligrams, and that's what's tested, what's coming out of the uh, polyethylene plants around the world. Uh, and there's about 25 major ones uh, that most of our polyethylene comes from um, for geomembranes. I love this uh, plot by um, Mueller, this table. Uh, it, it's very telling. And uh, it shows the first lie in geosynthetics or in, in geomembranes. Uh, 
the HDP is the com, uh, compounded formulation. You do not want HDPE resin. You are working with medium density resin and uh, it should be understood. Uh, all of these properties are, are measured on pure non-pigmented material. And uh, it's uh, extremely telling. As far as HDPE versus medium density, there's a little bit different branching. There's a lot different stress crack. There's a lot different crystallinity. Crystallinity is directly related to density and uh, it will change your uh, chemical resistance. But please realize we're dealing with medium density polyethylene and we're calling it, we're branding it HDP and that's for a marketing perspective only. You want medium density polyethylene. Now the additives and carbon black come in here and uh, this is, uh, Boyd Ramsey showed a beautiful picture from uh, a table from BASF in the forum. And I think that leads you down the way. Most of this is in powdered form and then sometimes comes with a carrier resin. But please realize carbon black is just uh, nothing but the uh, soot from a, a rich burn of uh, typically a, a gas. To, and carbon black has a lot of different variation to it. The uh, finer the carbon black, the better, but obviously the more expensive uh, the carbon black as well. This additive package, I showed you a couple of them. I love this uh, work by Faye and King. Um, the X axis here is temperature. Uh, two critical temperatures, 150 versus 200 degrees C. Uh, they're the breakoffs for um, high pressure and standard OIT. Obviously, the uh, uh, thiocinogenous and the hindered amines are only tested in a high pressure OIT uh, cell. Uh, please realize that uh, at 200 degrees C, you would just flash those things off. So Boyd Ramsey was right on target. Um, the GRI GM13 specification was made with this in mind and was made with an educated uh, consumer in mind. Good marriage of the additive package and the resin is important. Please realize you have processing aids. Uh, the UV absorbers are the carbon black or the titanium dioxide that will change things around between being uh, white and black. You have the uh, stabilizers, you'll typically uh, choose one of them. And then there's um, often an inhibitor that's in there um, and, and it becomes many. Um, I'm always learning with these things. I walked into a plant about two years ago and these people were bragging about what they were cleaning the dye lips with. Uh, this uh, processing aid made things uh, clean, last longer, oxidize less, I looked at it and sure enough, didn't it have Teflon in it? And uh, just last month, uh, New York DEC is, do you know any production of polyethylene that has a PFAS with it? And uh, I, I, I disclose this, but I, I hope manufacturers know what markets they're uh, making materials and that we're in the containment business. But this gets very complicated, very quick, and is certainly the uh, purview of um, chemical engineers. This is the second dirty secret of uh, membrane manufacturers, and this is particularly an adaptation from the film manufacturing to the uh, membrane manufacturing. Uh, this typically breaks off at 0.75 millimeters or 30 mil material is the break off, but please realize the uh, film folks have been using uh, calcium carbonate in the mix, in the formulation for long periods of time. It's in there in the neighborhood of five to 10% with a density of 1.65 to 1.72, which will really pop up the material. Uh, it's an anti-block or dispersant. It improves the mechanical properties, impact, tensile, tear, and puncture. Uh, it's non-toxic, inexpensive, decreases the surface tension, and also can help you with production because it'll stabilize the bubble in a blown film extruder. A lot of wins, but all downsides as far as durability are concerned. So uh, you can find this out by doing a carbon black content, and particularly with the secondary burn of ASTM D1603. So uh, 
it will give you an ash content as well as carbon black. You have to be aware of this. Okay, I'm telling you the secrets now, at least the secrets that I know, uh, huge problems associated with the carrier resins. This carrier resin is usually a low molecular weight and uh, it's carrying the AO package plus the carbon block. Uh, this added, this carrier resin has led to SIP problems in the, in the past. Uh, and I'm talking about separation in plane. Uh, it's again, has to be cho chosen carefully. It's not discussed very often. And uh, it certainly should be an extremely low molecular weight so that the uh, concentrate uh, distributes well when you add it to the base resin. This is finally what's added into the extruder of the, the hopper. And I don't know if you've been counting, but uh, there are at least 100 iterations of the polyethylene um, so far. So uh, this is uh, quite significant in uh, just black monolithic layers. And uh, now we're gonna go to further complicate things uh, from here. Uh, what happens with the uh, regrind or rework? Every uh, facility it has edge trim. This edge trim has gone through a heat cycle. It is typically uh, chipped and then reintroduced in uh, less than 10% into the formulation. Uh, this is in clause 4.3 of GM 13 and 17. Uh, it is not a secret by anybody of, in the industry. What is going on now um, is post-consumer uh, material. Uh, please realize that this is a very competitive business. Uh, post-consumer material can be brought back into a pelletized form. Uh, we have no idea of the traceability of this material. It's recycled and reclaimed. Uh, we don't know its age or what it has been used for. Um, I submit to you some of these uh, plants with inside facilities are superb. Um, they, they clean the material well. And uh, I have seen this used in GM membrane. This is not allowed in GRI GM 13 or 17 uh, for the concern of uh, stress cracking and also for the concern of um, uh, distribution. So uh, carbon, um, carbon black distribution uh, issues and uh, stress risers caused by that. We then have the extruder. Uh, Boyd pointed out in the forum very well that the mixing and the heating is advanced as well as the uh, screen packs are advanced. I think both of these cases are uh, very uh, well-founded. Uh, please realize though that uh, there are many tricks now on marrying processing aids to specific extruders, uh, which will uh, increase throughput. With all of that uh, variability, now you have two different types of extrusion, uh, blown film and wide mouth dye or cast line. Uh, please realize uh, if you were a manufacturer of material, uh, you would want different resin for these two. Uh, it's a much stiffer resin for a blown film than wide mouth. Obviously for a wide mouth, you would like uh, flowability for a cast line. Uh, this is a difference in melt flow index. Please realize GM 13 and 17 are absolutely silent on this property. Uh, this is not the case in certain countries around the world. Okay, so uh, if, if I haven't excited you yet, this is, there is a lot of variability here in these materials. It is certainly not black plastic. And uh, this polymer is an engineered polymer. And uh, hopefully we're engineering it for durability. And this is a re um, resistance to degradation. Um, this is for site-specific conditions and uh, very different applications out there, uh, buried, exposed, immersed in liquids, uh, could be in, in aggressive environments 
and it could be uh, just for a potable water in a reservoir application. So very different environments. I originally knew this from EPA 9090, um, the Risk Reduction Lab in Cincinnati, numerous uh, ASTM and uh, ISO task groups are working on this topic. Uh, Yeoman's work has been done and uh, numerous examples of compatibility are available out there in uh, case histories. There are also some uh, real uh, terrible case histories uh, that we've learned from in the past. In general, and I submit to you in general, uh, the reaction will take the ductility from the geomembrane and we'll be going from a ductile to a brittle behavior. You see the original curve in black and the incubated curve in red and what's going on is we've had a, uh, a, a decrease in strain, an increase, <coughs> pardon me, in modulus, and an increase uh, to some degree in uh, strength. Um, this is a cautionary tale. If people are bragging that their uh, material is getting stronger as it ages, this is not a good thing. So uh, please be cautious for this. The hypothetical uh, responses, um, you have an incubated value at time zero, then you're typically testing at 30, 60, 90, and 120 days of exposure. Again, you'll see the modulus increase, the strength uh, increase, and the strain decrease. And the best tell is probably the uh, strain decreasing uh, with respect to time. Superimposed on this, there are factors affecting uh, durability. Uh, nine of them here, I'll go through them. Uh, UV, radiation, chemical, hydrolysis, swelling, extraction, delamination, oxidation, and then a bio biologic concern. UV, especially if it's exposed and even exposed temporary. Uh, Ryan asked, please don't make it all geomembranes and uh, certainly the surface area is uh, working against you for other geosynthetics, particularly uh, geotextiles. So uh, UV degradation superimposed on this, uh, the given polymers are susceptible to UV in the um, in specific wavelengths. So uh, polyethylene around 300, uh, PET, the polyesters at 325, and polypropylene in the neighborhood of uh, 370. So uh, what you expose your material to is uh, very important, uh, the wavelength that your lights are at or uh, the UV exposure out in the field. This is typically done in a uh, weatherometer. Uh, xenon arc is available. Uh, UV fluorescent is available. Uh, this is the uh, standard which is called out in GRI GM 13. Um, it is identified as uh, 7238. Uh, the device has a uh, calibration cycle associated with it. There is a cat's eye uh, rotation of the bulbs and rotation of the specimen through the 120-day cycle, and then subsequently a tensile test as well as an OIT test is run on it. You can have outdoor exposure, uh, depending on your uh, latitude and longitude, uh, areas are uh, more intense than others. And this I should uh, come clean with you. I have never visited Australia. I, I, am, I am an engineer from the Northeastern part of the United States. Uh, my conditions are, are, I believe, are pretty humble compared to yours, uh, especially from the perspective of UV. Uh, this is uh, latitude and longitude dependent. It's also dependent on the, uh, the climate, particularly how much rainfall and what type of rainfall uh, you're getting. In regards to UV de degradation of fibers, and this is particularly important with uh, exposed geotextiles, as well as turf reinforcement mats, um, surface area, color, what resin the material is made from is critically important. I should point out to you that there'll be an ASTM STP uh, June in 2022 with Seattle, Washington. Uh, myself and Eric Blonde will uh, convene this um, and there should be written documents for it. 
it will emphasize uh, all geosynthetics and certainly not just GM membranes where the emphasis is, is, is certainly in this lecture. Uh, this idea of extraction is interesting, um, especially when we're putting dissimilar materials together. Um, people like the John Deere green geomembrane or the county line blue membrane or, or even red, which is uh, very difficult to uh, stabilize. Uh, this particular um, digester was an anaerobic digester for a uh, a cattle, cattle and animal feedlot, uh, this geomembrane inflates and goes back and forth depending on the pressure which is inside the digester. Uh, this was a complicated membrane. The membrane was green, clear, and then black. The clear uh, core was problematic. And uh, this clear core had no AO package. Uh, when you put uh, geomembranes with big AO package, particularly the, the black one, which is stabilized heavy, and the green one, which is not stabilized much, uh, you work, you uh, have big problems. And you can see the cracking on the green surface here. The, uh, the, the clear inside just scavenged the, uh, the, the AO package from the outside. It was quite mobile. And I think uh, Boyd Ramsey talked about that at your forum quite a lot. As far as radioactivity is concerned, uh, not, not bad for um, low level uh, waste, but you can't get too high in the radioactive intensity and still use uh, polymeric materials. Uh, the, the particles will go through it. Uh, polyethylene is good for low level uh, waste containment, but uh, beyond that, I think you run into problems. Chemical compatibility, uh, certainly there has been issues. It's the hallmark of uh, polyethylene. There are very um, few chains to go after. It's the difference between using a linear low on the, the cover and HD on the liner system. Um, also the, the difference in uh, thickness of the materials. As far as this is concerned, I think uh, both ISO and ASTM are, are very well positioned here. Uh, ASTM has a laboratory immersion as well as a field immersion uh, protocol and then test evaluation procedures for each of the geosynthetics. Um, you can set up in a, a sump in an adjacent facility to uh, prove um, effectiveness in this regard but uh, it works out quite well either in the laboratory or in the field immersion. Delamination is typically encountered when you have scrim reinforced materials. Uh, these materials uh, can take on water and uh, this can delaminate the material quite readily. As far as oxidation, that's typically how the uh, olefins will degrade both the polyethylene and the polypropylene. We have a, um, uh, an oven aging procedure as well as a UV uh, procedure um, in the GRI GM13 uh, standards. Uh, the oven is a forced air oven, which will uh, move the, the air within the oven uh, quite regularly. And then the evaluation is typically done with an octavative inductance time test, either with standard or high pressure. Uh, some people are surprised that uh, AS, our GRI GM13 has changed its procedure from uh, 3985 to uh, 8117. This is now out of the purview of the plastics industry and into the purview of D35, the geosynthetic industry. Using a very small sample, three milligrams, think of a, a rice kernel, uh, the pressure is different, uh, one atmospheric and the other uh, high pressure at uh, 3,500 kilopascals. The temperature is very different. Think of your, uh, your, your rice, uh, not your rice cooker, your, your pressure cooker. Um, certainly you can use lower temperatures and shorter times. If you utilize uh, pressure PV equals NRT, it should be uh, common sense to any engineer. The temperature of the standard uh, OIT cell is 200 C where the, temperature of the high pressure cell is 150. 
Um, values obviously uh, quite a bit different. And uh, the biggest factor for the high pressure cell is there's not an auto sampler on it. So uh, you can't switch things out. It's very slow and takes a long time. And for this reason, it's expensive. These are the different uh, cells that are available to you. And uh, like I said, uh, the, the standard cell is uh, automated and uh, much easier to use now with uh, replicate samples. The curves from this, uh, it's nothing more than a calorimeter. It has uh, two cells in it, one holding a reference, the other holding a specimen. The longer you can make it um, until that exotherm occurs, uh, the better. Um, that's the good marriage between the AO package and the, uh, the base resin. Uh, you see it for uh, standard OIT on top and uh, high pressure OIT on the bottom. As far as biologic is concerned, uh, animals are interesting. Uh, the, the, the membranes don't have a chance against the tooth of a, a rat or a, a something. If there's food beyond that, they're going right through it. Um, we had elk in a, in a, uh, in a basin. Um, you're you're going to have to do uh, protection for this. It's typically a coarse aggregate, uh, some sort of me metallic screen. If you need an expert guide on this, please go to the Dutch. Uh, they have levy systems and beautiful papers written on this, very humane uh, ways to do it. But uh, it, it, it is incredible, the, the effort that has been placed in this. And when asked, uh, you know, will... will uh, a mammal go through uh, a geomembrane. And I've seen mammals go through a cast iron pipe. So uh, yes, is the answer. If there's food on the other side and there's a desire, uh, the, the, the thin geosynthetics don't have a chance. There are synergistic effects to those big nine. So uh, temperature is an enabling variable for all of this, uh, which I discussed. The higher the temperature, the more rapid the degradation. Applied stress is also a complicating factor. Uh, it's site-specific and uh, needs to be modeled appropriately. Uh, what do I mean there is you might have stress at certain times. There might be stress relaxation. There might be residual stress in the material. All of this needs to be taken into consideration, uh, particularly around the pertinences and uh, and details. Multiple degradation factors, uh, one time and then change. Um, please realize Mother Earth would like to uh, reach equilibrium. I see this with pH often. pH will start high and then back down uh, to near neutral within a, a given amount of time. So uh, pretty, pretty regular. So that's far as the degradation mechanisms are concerned. Now I'd like to go into a uh, lifetime prediction. Uh, following is certainly a common way to evaluate materials. And there, there are not only hundreds, I think there are thousands of references uh, to this. You typically are using time temperature superposition, and then you'll plot up an Arrhenius plot, and he won a Nobel for this, so it's uh, pretty well adopted. And then extrapolate it down to uh, site-specific uh, temperatures. They're typically uh, three stages defined uh, for polyethylene, and uh, this is written up in the literature quite regularly. Typically in the laboratory, you'll have a reaction vessel. This will uh, have a stress it will have different temperatures and it's usually different uh, aqueous solutions. The incubated property will look like this. Uh, you'll have an antioxidant depletion, which is A, B will be the inductance time of the polymer and C will be the half-life. And I emphasize half-life, that's 50% of the property that you're measuring. Uh, typically in our cases, we're looking at strain or OIT. Um, you will run the, uh, the experiment at, at a minimum in triplicate. Uh, here we ran it in quadruplicate, uh, 55, 65, 75, and 85. You beam over to that 50% value 
uh, of that measured property. And then you'll like to plot it up on an Arrhenius plot. The slope of that curve is important. And then beaming that down to the site-specific temperature is also critically important. And please realize this is the half-life. Uh, there's still life in the material, but this is conservative. And uh, certainly you can hang your hat on it. Um, it is truly the half-life of the property that's measured. So what is the conclusion from all this? HDP uh, lifetime uh, estimates. Um, Antioxidant depletion in the neighborhood of 50 to 150 years, induction times in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 years, half-life estimates in the neighborhood 200 to 750 years. That means my polyethylene is going to last in the neighborhood of 270 to 1,000 years. Um, this, again, is written about often. Uh, nobody has lived 1,000 years to, uh, to, to witness it. Um, but uh, this is the expectation of these materials. We have done a lot of work in landfills and what are the temperatures in landfills? Uh, all that work was done at 20 degrees C. As I said earlier, as you increase the temperature, you decrease the total uh, expectance lifetime of the material. You can see as you step up in five degree increments, we are drastically reducing the lifetime prediction of this material. I have a good friend, George Hareton, who said, you know, the bottom of a landfill is a tremendous place to store a geomembrane if you keep it at 20 degrees C. Um, if you have an exotherm down there, it's quite a different thing. So uh, please realize this. I don't know about Australia, but everybody's from Missouri in the United States. Nobody believes, uh, I mean, that people believe, but uh, they, they want to be shown this. So uh, I, I've made a, a living of digging up landfills. Uh, there are many papers on this. Uh, this is uh, two cases of uh, 1.5 millimeter, both smooth and textured GM membranes. After 25 years of being exposed to leachate in the municipal solid waste facility, uh, the GM membranes behaved excellently. Uh, these are not very fancy formulations. They're uh, bare bones formulations. Uh, standard OIT was fine for the analysis and uh, the membranes were working great. Exposed lifetime prediction is quite a different animal than I just presented to you. Uh, buried lifetime is very well established. The regulators, owners, and designers are becoming acceptable for adequate uh, geosynthetic durability when it's covered. Exposed is a very different uh, proposition. Uh, full oxygen, UV exposure, high temperature and stress from wind, fundamentally different, um, different environments and totally, and uh, the membranes do not last as long. You will uh, see this um, irradiance plot. It's ever increasing. So uh, it's quite uh, interesting to see this uh, change uh, with respect to time. We try to simulate uh, this with uh, UV exposure. I showed this to you earlier. Um, in our regard, we incubate samples until their half-life. You're experts at that now. We record the UV energy at half-life. We obtain the UV energy from a field uh, project. We give a uh, ratio or approximate uh, field uh, life. We do a temperature. Uh, we, we uh, the temperature correlation is not available and please realize this is uh, a very approximate uh scientists cringe when engineers like me do things like this but i need answers so i'm a practical person and this is how you would get a uh, a practical answer from this bob kerner and i and grace swan uh, I, th I think made a very lovely paper in uh, geo americas and it's available through uh, Geosynthetic International, I certainly can give it to you. 
but this is the laboratory half-life versus exposure or predicted exposure in Phoenix, Arizona. You see it in strength as well as elongation. We also now have done it for OIT, which um, is, is, is good, but please realize we're not talking about thousands of years now. Uh, this is exposure of material in the neighborhood of uh, 70 to 90 for HD, uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 50 to 65 in uh, linear low, and then the other materials uh, tail off from that. Sure enough, I'm from Missouri again. Really, I'm from Philadelphia, but uh, you want to see how this behaves in the field. These are two projects, 22-year uh, and 16-year exposed. Uh, the material, it was uh, HDPE uh, behaving extremely well. I have uh, papers on this with all the data that's uh, available to you. Um, the, the materials have performed excellently in an exposed condition. Okay, I have to come clean now. Most of the discussion, which I've talked to you about, is based on smooth, monolithic, 1.5 or 60 mil uh, thick uh, geomembranes. That, 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 that's fascinating because 65% of the geomembranes sold in the world is textured. To my knowledge, no, no, no one would ever hang their hat on this. Uh, it, it is, again, not talked about in our industry, but uh, it can't behave better. I, I, I submit this to you. This, there is no way textured material can behave better than a monolithic uh, smooth material. In addition to that, there is no discussion about the worst seam that's available to us, which is the fillet extrusion seam. There are some folks in South Africa who are trying to improve this procedure. I've just spent months trying to help them in this regard. I failed miserably, but uh, I, I, they're, they're, they're really fantastic people. But uh, I, I, would, I would like to, you need to know, this is a package. This is the weakest link. And these two things are certainly much weaker links than uh, the durability of smooth geomembrane. We need an honest and frank discussion in regards to these definitions of half-life, which is the measurable strength, strain, or OIT loss. Service life, which is the uh, functional life of the hydraulic barrier. And then end of life, how you measure these things is also interesting, but then to go down into powdered form of materials. And yes, th there, there are residual metals in the parts per billion or parts per trillion in these polymers left over. And from a sustainability and green technology, we're going to have to answer to that. But uh, these are providing, these are engineered materials. These are not single use materials. Okay, uh, you think I've gone out on a limb prior to this? Uh, it's nothing compared to this chart. So when are you concerned? And this comes mostly from the surface impoundment industry. So you're reaching the end of service life when you have a thickness decrease of 30%. That might sound large to you, but uh, I'm factoring in there the uncertainty of the, uh, the test method. The, uh, the density increase, and this is an increase in density of 0 0.04. OIT, a third of the specification, that's 33 for the uh, standard, and that's uh, 133 minutes for high pressure. As far as stress crack, 150. And you're probably going to say, hey, Gio, where'd you get that from? That's the baseline union carbide resin that I've pulled out of more landfills than I could admit. So uh, that, that resin was disqualified, but I can tell you it's performing pretty well in the field and it's probably the most tested uh, geomembrane that I know. Melt flow index, 30% change. 
tensile elongation that's probably the the most uh, referenced value that 50 percent decrease uh that's the one that's most uh known and uh most agreed upon initial and break modulus and this uh 30 percent stiffening uh of the material is uh but you have to be sharp with the uh, stress strain curve and unfortunately you have to test it the same way uh, with an extensometer or without. So uh, you need to know where, how the baseline was tested. Uh, this is one of my favorites, uh, fails an impact resistance test. The dear friend who's passed away, uh, Andre Roland and Ian, uh, Ian hasn't passed, but uh, the, the two of them uh, championed very much uh, this. And I think it's very good, particularly for cold region uh, climates. The best tell that I know is, can you still seam the material? And this is a real practical approach, but uh, whew, it's a beautiful tell. If you can't seam the material, it's certainly aged enough that you're uh, well beyond its uh, service life. Observation of uh, chalking, flaking, and cracking. Uh, yes, I've written about this uh, quite handily and published it. I've, uh, I stand behind it. I, uh, it's a nice checklist, and if you have additions to it, I certainly would like to hear from you. Okay, I put this in, and uh, I uh, really think that GM13 has serviced the uh, industry quite well. Um, I I'm sorry, I was there in the beginning of it, so uh, I, I know the, the sweat and the, the blood that was... Uh, I have never been in a room where something was agreed upon, a consensus document like this, where, where emotions were, were so high. I, I, the people, you have to appreciate what went into making this. And I offer up these six changes, but I, I guarantee none of them. Uh, this is, uh, first of all, follow Eric's lead. Uh, change OIT criteria to a minimum average. And yes, it's a minimum average now. If um, 8117 goes through, it'll be three OIT tests. Um, and get away from that percent retain value. Uh, this would benefit tremendously um, materials that, that blow away the specification, so to speak. Um, you're penalized tremendously uh, unless you just meet the criteria for OIT. If you're far in excess of it, uh, you're penalized handily. What that minimum average value would be is uh, going to be horse trading at its best. So that, that'll be interesting. State that all OIT values are uh, from a 10 uh, mil plaque uh, made from homogenized uh, material and the best homo uh, homogenizing uh, procedure we know is a two roll mill. Uh, that's of the three techniques that are out there. Uh, this is going through ASTM. I'm not familiar if it's going through ISO, but uh, this is reared its head uh, last week at ASTM D35 in both standard and high pressure. I know the folks at Queens uh, would like an and instead of an or for all three OIT criteria. Uh, this is assuming people are not uh, educated consumers. Uh, possibly it's time for this. Uh, I don't know if the manufacturers will buy into this, but uh, certainly that's a, a change that can be talked about in the task group. Uh, please realize that uh, the surfactant uh, CA or CO630 used in uh, stress cracking has, um, IJPAL has a benzene ring in it. It is no longer allowed by the REACH directive in the EU and uh, some Latin American countries. It is allowed in uh, the US and we are doing massive round robins to try to get a replacement surfactant. Uh, this, again, will be quite a tough pill to swallow, but uh, we're trying our best here at the Institute for that. Add a strain hardening modulus criteria to the specification. That's the tail end of the curve. 
an excellent paper by Helmut Zanzinger, Boyd Ramsey, and Ed Zimmel in this regard. Um, I think uh, the time has come to really look at it. I think a lot of people have relationships be, um, be, that for the strain hardening uh, modulus and uh, related to uh, stress crack. And then the last one is off of the, the folks at Queens and particularly Professor Rowe uh, to add a, uh, a more rigorous uh, bleach or caustic soda uh, immersion durability challenge to the specification. Um, if you want, you can take down polyethylene. Um, you'll have to do it aggressively with one of these solutions, but uh, certainly um, you can uh, do that if you expose it to a halogen or an oxidizer. Okay, so in summary, I'd like to give a little room for a question Q&A. Uh, GM membranes, I think, really work well, uh, have uh, revolutionized the containment industry over the past 35 years. I think this, uh, as of now, you'd be remiss if you didn't use a, a GM membrane if you were trying to contain things. Um, buried lifetime are hundreds of years, uh, exposed are, are 30 year plus, and uh, designers know that now. I think we uh, need a, a, qual a comprehensive quality system approach. I'm sort of circling around to my third slide here to address service life design and end of life GM membranes. I think regulators, owners, consultants are asking these questions. Um, Fred, uh, anger is not correct, but Frank, Fred's um, anxiety, I, I, I guess, uh, about this is very well founded. And uh, it is frustrating. Uh, we, many engineers are not polymer science. And uh, they, they, they just want a membrane to work, darn it, for the application they have. And uh, this might be something where you're doing application uh, specific GM membranes. Um, it, it appears there is a want to create that. I, I do have to uh, tell you very upfront and honestly uh, the new GM membranes are in high demand. And I tell you, they're a low supply. Uh, in the U.S. over the last six months, uh, I know five installers that have had to enact force majeure and give up their bonds. Uh, th this is a radical time to be doing uh, uh, changes to GRI, GM 13 and 17. I, I applaud efforts like this. But uh, please realize there are many forces uh, working here. So uh, just be cognizant of that. I'd like to acknowledge and sincerely acknowledge the uh, support of the GSI Consortium. They allow me to do things like this. And I'm honored to do it, but I have to thank them. And I thank them uh, very happily. Uh, thank you for listening. You can touch me in many ways uh, here, obviously. But uh, touch me at the Geosynthetic Institute. I answer the GMA tech line, and uh, certainly my email is available to anyone. Uh, I'm here to service the industry, and I, I gladly do it. So uh, it's been my pleasure to be with you. I wish it was in person, but uh, that's what I had prepared for you today. Thank you, George. Um, that was great presentation. Um, we have time for <clears throat> a bit of Q&A and we have probably around 20 number, uh, people in the room here and uh, I'm asking everyone to think about questions and uh, you can come to the microphone and ask your question or maybe shout out from there to see how it goes and if George can hear us. Um, I have one question here from Jonathan uh, from New Zealand. Just read that question. Jonathan for Shamrock, I know that guy. He's a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Jonathan, for the question. Uh, the geomembrane forms part of a barrier system that is also reliant on the protection geotextile to limit the stresses on the geomembrane. How much work has been done on the durability of buried protection geotextile specifically? 
um, tremendous uh, work, particularly in Germany in this regard. And the Germans will only allow polyethylene geomembranes for puncture protection. Uh, you're getting your best durability out of uh, polyethylene. Um, I certainly would uh, look at the work that was done at the bomb in that regard. Um, I have dug up uh, facilities where um, uh, PET geotextiles have been degraded, but uh, I've learned that there are many uh, differences in uh, the um, polyester resins in that regard. Uh, next one, uh, I don't have a name for the person who asked the question, but the question is, is about uh, smooth and textured. So can you elaborate a bit more on this smooth geomembrane behaves better than a textured geomembrane? Okay, there are four different texturing processes. Uh, the first is impingement. The second is nitrogen expulsion. The uh, third is spray applied. And the fourth is a uh, foaming agent. So all of them vary. All of them have bring a stress concentration uh, to the surface. Some are made with different extruders. Uh, none of this is going to add to the durability of the material. And also the surface area of attack is different as well. Uh, there in no way can be... Um, a similarity in this regard, please realize that in some countries in Europe, they will only allow a monolithic smooth geomembrane to be placed under a hazardous waste facility. And it is a durability concern. It's a much thicker membrane uh, than we're talking about. Uh, we typically in the US will do 1.5. In some cases, it's uh, going up to a two millimeter thick uh, for containment, but uh, in Europe, we regularly see a three millimeter thick geomembrane. Monolithic layer. Thank you. Um, I get a question from the, from the room here. Graham, good question. Uh, George, you mentioned the two different manufacturing processes, flat dye and blown film. Um, can you talk about the different properties that result from those processes? Sure. Uh, the big two differences, one will be thickness. The uh, thickness on a cast line is uh, very much controlled. So uh, you will have a, a difference straight away in uh, thickness control on a cast line versus a blown film line. The second major uh, variation in property will be melt flow index, like I indicated earlier. Um, one is stiffer than the other. Uh, the, the stiffer one is the uh, blown film line, and that's so that the bubble is maintained uh, as it comes out of the uh, concentric rings of the extruder for the blown film line. Um, I get a question uh, from the online uh, attendees. The question is, do you see a welding benefit on either smooth or textured? Tremendous. So a um, smooth geomembrane is much easier to uh, clean and uh, dry than a uh, textured geomembrane. The textured geomembrane will uh, attract the subgrade soil as well as dust particles from above. Uh, in most cases, most textured geomembrane will have a smooth um, edge. That smooth edge uh, varies from uh, 100 to 300 millimeters, depending on what manufacturer you're using. And I should say that there are techniques of doing smooth taped edges. Uh, they're they're removal of a, a tape just prior to seaming so you have a fresh area to be bonded. Um, the technology is ever advancing. Simic, I can answer that. In our testing, um, George, do you hear Warren from the distance? Or? You come closer to the microphone. Yeah. In our um, destructive seam testing that we carry out, 
we'd say that probably 80% of the failures that we get are when people are welding textured, textured, but no smooth edge. So from a pure DT perspective, I'd say probably 80% of the, of the failures of textured geometries. Because they come you'll, you'll have them. You'll have them on all the butt seams. Um, the longitudinal seams are protected, but the uh, butt seams will be uh, textured to textured, uh, which is quite problematic. Make sure you shingle them down gradient. Uh, question from Mark Aspect. Uh, Hello, George. Um, I'm just wondering your experience. There's a bit of a move towards deformulation of, of these, you know, using M NMR and these things for critical applications in Australia. Have you have you seen much of that? And do you have an, an opinion on the way the industry, you know, manufacturers will they come kicking and screaming, or do we have to bring them in kicking or screaming? Mike, you're you're right on target, and uh, please realize the chemical fingerprinting with inside GM 13 and 17 are very blunt instruments. Um, uh, yes is the answer. Uh, I see people uh, trending in that direction. Um, at 60 years old, I don't think it's in my purview any longer, but uh, yes, the, uh, the younger ones will, uh, will, will get to know this and uh, have a much better feel for this. Um, a, a, Again, and a relatively small sample, and uh, you're going to have to find out the statistics of that technique uh, down the line. I have personally very little experience with this. Uh, we have a huge state university who uh, specializes in, in this, and uh, this is the next move. Uh, the people in South Africa are insisting that as you make a fillet extrusion scene, uh, you should rapidly quench it with a cold rag. This would uh, create an amorphous region uh, and a much more ductile seam than the brittle seam. And uh, their next move is to go to uh, IR for this. Mike, you, you, you could have been clairvoyant. I don't, I don't know if you were, you were thinking along those lines, but those subtleties uh, will have to be determined with a um, much better bag of tricks than I I'm used to with, uh, and I'll tell you, you know, carbon black melt flow, OIT density. Um, so they're, they're, they're blunt instruments to what you're talking about. As far as the formulation, I, I don't, I don't think, manufacturers are going to give that up you know they'd be guarding that like they're first born I, I i don't i don't see that i i don't know what the upside was it can you imagine doing the traceability on this no <laughs> mark says no <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, the next one from our online audience, uh, Hossein, uh, is asking a question about uh, resins. Do you think using two different resins, for example, HDP and LLDP, can reduce the geomembrane durability? Well, it's uh, we're hoping it does the exact opposite. You uh, chase the stress crack away. Uh, you, it, it, it's like most things in life, it's a balance. And uh, I, can, I can assure you that phenomenon occurred about 15 years ago. And you'd be su surprised at the blending of uh, resins at, at this moment uh, if you were allowed to see the cut sheets of the manufacturers. As far as the, the durability is concerned, uh, you have to tell me what type of environment you're, you're going after. My shock uh, about the industry is uh, you really don't need that much chemical uh, incompatibility. Uh, these leachates that we're worried about, but uh, they're, they're not nearly as aggressive on the GM membranes as we had anticipated earlier on. 
I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't make general comments like that. You, you've recorded it, but uh, I'm, I'm getting. I'm going to get in terrible trouble with this. There's a. Uh, there, there are severe environments where you have to worry. That's right. Um, George, the next question is from the room here. I'll have Amir asking the next question. Uh, hi, George. How are you? Uh, I Find me. Question about the situation that we have your membranes that will be exposed for a while and then covered for uh, some other time. So normally the, the studies are on exposed your membrane or covered your membrane. What if we have a combination? Is there any study on the effect or what, how does it affect or is there any correlation there or not yet? Oh, this is a, this is a dangerous one and uh, you should assume the worst. Uh, you should abs assume uh, exposed um, lifetimes in that regard uh, because it, if we're talking years here of exposed, uh, this is this is certainly uh, where the material is suspect and uh, certainly uh, of great concern. You you've more than than compromised the material by exposing it for several years. Bury it as soon as possible, and it, we're talking about time frame within months, not not years. Thank you. Uh, the next question. What's a, a very good question in regards to uh, that I saw come up in the chat about the 500 stress crack hours. I have a very strong opinion on this, and I, it's not liked in the industry. We're, we're playing games here with this 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 hour stress crack. Uh, please realize the surfactant in the bath needs to be changed out and uh, the, the stress is, is doing all sorts of funny things. That test was never meant to run um, much more than 500 hours, let alone a thousand hours. So I, I, have, I have a strong restraint about people bragging. Pretty soon we're gonna be uh, testing stress cracking re resistance of linear low density polyethylene. It's not a... Uh, it's not any surprise that the numbers will be tremendous. Great question. Cool. Um, Daniel is asking a question from an online audience. Um, the question is, are there any changes that will be made in GM 17? Oh yeah, we're, we're Daniel, we're trying. Uh, this is, if you, if you want, if you want to have theater, this is this is it. You get a bunch of manufacturers in the room and try to to agree on on where these specifications should go. This is this is like a blood sport. This is people really. This this changes reactors. This changes. It, it, it's not so easy to just change things around. Uh, we'll, we'll try, but. Uh, We'll run it in front of the task group and see what happens. But I, I, I certainly make no promises. Uh, the best way where change comes is that if the regula the regulators adopt it. And uh, this has happened. We've had extreme, it must happen the same in Australia where uh, I, I can say it freely. Uh, it's an individual, uh, Bob Fanuf in New York with part 360. Uh, they're going away from 1.5 millimeter to two uh, as I speak for the bottom liner. So uh, they're, they're, the change comes through the regulators and then we will we'll sort of push it beyond this. Just like the change came when uh, NSF 54 dissolved and the US EPA asked us to make uh, GM 13 and 17. Um, next one is about uh, high friction angle related products. Um, the question is, is there proven results that can be comp compared to a standard gym membrane? We have seen that standard gym membrane is same or similar. Uh, we have not. We, uh, we just um, finished proficiency tests this year with a uh, 
a micro spike liner, which is a tremendous friction angle. And uh, you actually will, the needle punch non-woven textile, you, you can even take the failure up into the, the net of the composite away from the interface. It's so, it has such a Velcro effect. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't concur with the uh, the questioner's uh, logic here. Yes, they can. I I think they can make um, friction material to have tremendous friction angles. You 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 feel like Spider Man walking on them. In that, in that regard, you can make chicken skin too, which is uh, very close to smooth, which has a directionality and is, is terrible. It, you, you don't even want to call it uh, textured sheet, but there's a tremendous variability and uh, that should certainly be appreciated and tested. Uh, and I, I really think you should run site-specific direct shear testing to evaluate this under specific conditions. Great. Um, I have another question from Graham in the room. Uh, George, uh, white, um, white upper surface material is very um, popular in Australia these days. Can you talk to the durability of white material compared to black? Not as good. Um, the uh, white material is stabilized with titanium dioxide. Uh, you get a tremendous benefit by uh, decreasing the surface temperature, uh, a lot less wrinkles as well. So uh, textured white is uh, the preferred uh, geomembrane when placing in arid climates. Uh, we see that a lot. As far as the uh, durability is concerned, the uh, stabilization are much less. And uh, one of your forum members, uh, Boyd Ramsey, is under contract for studying the uh, longevity of this. He uh, has several case histories, and we're doing the laboratory exposure for him on that exact study. So uh, he'll get you actual good numbers on that, but from uh, several different manufacturers. Um, looks like Jonathan Shamrock has more questions. I'm going to allow him to talk. Uh, Jonathan from Auckland, New Zealand. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, George. How are um, you? Good new. <laughs> Gosh, I was with you. I, I wish I was with you. Uh... Um, thanks again for the great presentation. Just given the fact that the half-life is not really addressing the main barrier, function. Do you have any ideas how we could measure that serviceability life that you spoke about? Sure, you need a double line system. Um, that's, that's basically a lysimeter underneath. Uh, everybody wants to know the US's data, but so many people only have a single composite. You'll need a, a double composite liner and uh, that's proof in the day. Uh, when you when you see leachate or you see breakthrough uh, through that, I, I never hope to live that long to see that in uh, one of my facilities. But uh, that that would be the uh, true proof of uh, the performance of the material. Please realize that all uh, 27 um, municipal solid waste facilities in New York State uh, have to report this. Uh, to an open audience every year. So uh, we know the efficiencies of those facilities quite well. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, we have a second question now from Angeline Yang. Uh, the question is, is, is multi-axial property valuable also for GM13, besides GM17? Because the sheet that geomembrane is being laid on may not be fully flat. Oh no, no, this this you're you're confusing things there. That that that's not a multi-axial uh, test. Uh, although I've run uh, multi-axial tests on membrane or HDP geomembranes for the last 15 years. Um, I think you're talking about strain in the geomembrane, and that strain is more of a uh, out of plane deformation in a puncture mode. Uh, this is championed uh, by the bomb and also SKZ in, uh, in Germany. 
Uh, I think uh, the people at Queens, uh, Brockman in particular, has uh, worked on this in a big way of uh, addressing strains. Um, the, the British, as well as the people in the EU, are bantering around 3% strains. Um, the, the US, uh, I think, goes up to about 6 to be honest with you. Um, please realize yield stress, yield um, strain in a geo, HDP geo membrane is in the neighborhood of 15 to 18. So uh, you have some safety. Um, the way you're measuring it, the way you're calculating it, a lot, lot of discussion there. Um, but I, I, I don't think that's a multi-axial mode. I think that's more of a, uh, a puncture uh, strain that you would like to work on. And uh, there, there are even specialized ISO devices for that. So, uh, and then how to measure it. And uh, I'd point you in the direction of uh, Richard Brockman's work. Uh, I think we can continue for another four minutes until 10.30. Uh, I've got heaps of more questions coming through. If you want your questions to be asked, um, maybe after the webinar, if you type them in the Q&A rather than the chat box, we can actually get a report out of it and email to George and get um, George's opinion later. Um, and make sure you actually put your name down so we can send the responses back to you. Um, another question about degradation, George. Uh, should degradation be taken into account when considering composite liner interface friction? So you're, you're asking, is the, the texturing coming off or is the, the texturing changing with respect to time? I, I can tell you something I've just learned recently that I, I, I never thought creep was a degradation mechanism. Uh, Mike Dolby has always convinced me this. Uh, and you, you do a wide width tensile test of a polymer before and after a creep test. And the strength is always the same. But uh, you can tell Mike is in the wall and slope business. He's not in the membrane business. The degradation mechanism comes in regards to the strain. You can't get the strain back. So once a membrane strains, it's gone. So uh, you, you, you've created a, a strain hardened material and a more brittle material, which uh, that, that was a revolution to me. I, I really was, that was a, an aha moment within the last couple of years. I, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Yeah, the, the, the question was from Sharon. So if you want to um, type in again, if you, or if you want to stick live, just let me know. In the, in the Some texturings don't, don't stay on to your fingernail. You just need enough so that you don't go into uh, past peak into residual. So it, it, it's it's not. I, I I can answer that for there there are four different types of texturing. Great. Um, maybe the last question, George, uh, for today uh, about specification. So from a specifier's point of view, you mentioned looking at minimum values as as a measure. We have seen specs with average values to be met when looking at manufacturers. TDS, which I think is technical color sheet. Sometimes the values do not meet the average requested in the spec. Do you think we should specify minimum values? No, no, you're you're very confused here. This is you you have to ask very what what is the value you're comparing in the standard? And uh, for instance, you'll do uh, five tensile tests, and the value you're comparing is the average. That's why it's a minimum average. Uh, you, you have to be crystal clear on this uh, when you enter into an agreement. If you are going to uh, vary from what you're specifying, uh, these are not off-the-shelf membranes any longer. 
So uh, crystal clear as far as the difference between uh, minimums, averages, MARVs uh, across the line. So you, you have to have this, this down, this vernacular down uh, prior to entering into agreement or you'll be extremely disappointed and in for a fight. Please realize the manufacturers have an entire staff of people uh, reviewing these specifications that come in. All right, I think that's what we have time for today. Um, thanks a lot, George. It was, uh, it was a great pleasure to have you in our events today. Um, I think it should be near 8.30 or something your time um, evening. So thanks for um, participating in our events. Um, and um, I hope um, everyone enjoyed this uh, webinar. So the next one in the program is a case study by our um, uh, event sponsor, Fabtech. Um, so we stay online um, until midday Australia time. So we have two case studies um, and also a lecture from Natalie Tooth, which comes out of that. So for people joining us online, uh, we, we have uh, the program going until almost midday uh, Australia time. Thanks again, George, and um, we'll see you later. Take care now. All right, so we're going to have the case study now. I just have to close some of these windows. Um, Graham, Yeah. Is this the microphone? Is that the microphone? Well, it's like a stomach in Well, you prefer to sit here or stand there or? Um, I don't mind standing here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 What was that? After this, I think, yeah. Uh, well, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to, um, to make this uh, brief case study presentation. The event for sustainability and durability, sustainability examples here, um, just because they're really, really nice um, images, really. So, this, this first example is um, in the Marshall Islands in Marjorie. You can see it highlighted on the left there, um, particularly vulnerable to uh, sea, uh, sea level rises. Um, and uh, they have no water on the island. Uh, all the water on the island, all the drinking water on the island comes from the, the airport um, runway. Um, you can see that the top right here, uh, these are storages here, uh, lime, lime storages, cut storages, uh, and run up and, and provide drinking water for the, for the people of uh, Marjorie. Next. 
came out with uh, people on my account to see the presentation. Oh. Now, I don't so. No? Just see. <coughs> and, and the second uh, sustainability example there is. Um, a solar farm providing energy to um, uh, uh, clean um, seawater. This is a tomato uh, growing facility. Um, it's it's self sufficient in terms of uh, it's for everything, including power, um, water from the ocean, which is just, just nearby. Um, and then the ponds in the foreground of the seawater coming in, the ethnic going out, and in between the, the glass houses, you can see there's a, a covered storage where the clean water is used. Irrigated tomatoes, a very really interesting example of the quite eye catching pictures. So, I'm going to talk now in terms of durability about an uh, anaerobic lagoon cover, uh, the design of that cover, and particularly material selection, durability being a key part of that. Briefly, there's something about the project background, um, the design, how we selected the materials, and, and convinced ourselves um, they'd be sufficiently durable, and a little bit about, about construction. So um, uh, I'm sure I'm sure you're pretty much all aware that an anaerobic um, reactor um, uh, treats wastewater. Um, byproducts are methane. Methane is um, very damaging greenhouse gas, yes, but also a very useful source of uh, energy and power. So correctly used um, is a renewable energy source. Um, there's typical examples here uh, on the the top right is uh, what's seen regularly in uh, in Asia, a lagoon with just a big flat sheet. Um, and operate under pressure like a big bouncy castle. Uh, the bottom picture is more typically what, what's built in Australia, a negative pressure cover with, um, with better control. Um, and in the middle is the, is the case study project. Um, interesting um, question about uh, uh, the service life of the material and what's its half life and when's it, when's it, when's it reaching its life? Well, that's clearly exceeded end of its life. Because the um, the loads in, imposed on the cover are great, yeah. are greater than the um, greater than the um, the strength of the material. That material was only twelve years old. Um, it was uh, reinforced uh, polypropylene um, and uh, didn't perform adequately. So, in terms of what we need in the in the design, the, the bottom pictures show you the uh, the design of the cover and the and the completed cover, the new cover that was built just recently, just a few months ago. Um, it needs to resist wind load. Um, the co this cover, while it's a negative pressure cover, when, when uh, the plants are not operating, it has to store gas, and so it becomes, for a short period of time, positive pressure cover, and then therefore has to resist wind loads. There's a fair amount of scum buildup um, underneath the cover, so it has to cope with those loads. Um, there's a ballasting system on the cover to manage gas paths and, uh, and water, which creates a, a permanent um, load in the cover. But most importantly is, um, is actually um, the, um, the chemical and UV attack of the material. So it's exposed cover. George spoke about exposed life being much shorter than buried life. And it's also sitting on fat soils and greases, which are particularly damaging for um, geomembranes. And also where there are gas paths underneath the cover, um, there's the hydrogen sulfide both as gas, but that gas then condenses on the geomembrane. There's, there's a highly acidic, uh, localized, highly acidic environment. So I borrowed this um, table on the bottom left from um, uh, Meat and Livestock uh, Australia. It's quite a good um, a summary of the material choices available for, for anaerobic reactor covers. Starting on the left with um, high density polyethylene, um, moving to CSP on the right, that's pretty much um, a line of cost. Um, CSPE and EIA uh, membranes are much, much more expensive than HDPE. Generally, um, uh, LLDPE doesn't have sufficient 
chemical performance in these applications, so it isn't used. Polypropylene, you can see from the example, is unsuitable. Um, and so really the choices are the expensive VIA CSP options or, or HDP. HDP is um, uh, pretty good chemically, so it's a good candidate material, needs careful design to avoid creating flexing or multi-axial strain conditions that uh, are the Achilles heel of, of HDP. Um, so, so to prove, uh, George didn't put up the three he spoke to, but didn't put up the three stage um, model that's, that's pretty well used, uh, particularly polyethylene geomembrane. membrane. So stage one is where the additive package is protecting um, the, um, the geomembrane. membrane. Uh, once the additive package is consumed, um, there's um, uh, minor changes in the materials properties that are almost immeasurable. And then we, then we get to the, to the stage where properties are measurably declining and this, this notional 50% performance loss. Um, so we wanted to prove that the, um, the, the uh, material, the candidate material was going to be suitable. So we did accelerated testing with two different sorts. <coughs> Pardon me. We didn't do UV uh, on the basis that we knew the HDP was capable in the UV environment. We did immersion testing. We didn't do acid either on the basis we knew that the material was good in acid. Uh, we just did um, immersion testing in the liquid, got liquid from the, the lagoon, um, elevated to um, 75 degrees C. I did a whole bunch of tests on the regular two mil thickness material. And we also um, uh, compressed the material down to 0.25 mil uh, thickness. Uh, it meant that we couldn't do mechanical properties, but we could do the OIT testing. Um, and uh, and by, by, by those arrangements, we got 60 times uh, acceleration for the thick material and over 200 times acceleration for the thin film. And here are the results. So uh, it's interesting, George's comments again. So in terms of the mechanical properties, the bottom left, I hadn't drawn the mechanical properties there because they didn't change. The elongation didn't change. The tensile strengths didn't change within that window. So clearly demonstrating for the thick material, we were within the stage one um, aging profile of the material. The one property that did change was stress crack resistance. As you would expect, it always drops to a stable level uh, in its early life. And in this case, it dropped to about 60% of original and then stayed, um, stayed flat. So again, that's um, showing that we're well within the stage one life. So that tells us that the, um, the material with a 60 times aging uh, factor <coughs> is still well well within um, at stage one. So within circa 20 years we've tested, we're still well within stage one um, of the life of the membrane. And then if we look at the thin film, the uh, the orange the orange curve on the right is the uh, is the standard OIT. It took about eight weeks to degrade to nothing. Resi residual of about five percent. And, and if you multiply that, that takes it to about 30 years life for stage one again. So well in excess of the 20 year design life. Interestingly, um, if you look at the, um, uh, the blue curve on the right, that's standard OIT for the thick material. Um, and, that, and that again is showing really good life if you project that uh, 20 years. And also the white curve is the oven aging showing that the material performance is pretty much the same in air, elevated air temperature, as, uh, as in the fogs. So um, a good formulation for this particular application. And then briefly construction. So <coughs> uh, you can see the photograph on the top right is um, uh, partially removed cover. Uh, some of the, both the top and the bottom areas have been removed. Uh, cover is actually relatively a uh, large amount of mass, so you need mechanical equipment to remove the cover. And once it's removed, you can see how much uh, scum uh, was left behind that had to be removed. When we were building, when we, we designed the cover, we designed the cover um, so that we could um, separate the first third of the cover, um, because that's where the high gas production area was in the lagoon, and we could commission and, uh, and restart up the gas plant a third of the way through construction and continue to build the remaining uh, two thirds while the gas plant was operating. Another key factor in construction was, of course, when, when it was originally built, it was a sterile lagoon, no gas. We, we had to build this with um, 
with methane, have to be very careful, we've had no ignition, ignition sources uh, and safe evacuation procedures in the event that uh, we have any problems. And, um, and you can see on the top left, there's the um, floating work platform that was progressively moved along, along, the, um, along the lagoon. It was about um, a five month build process to build, build that. Um, you can see the bottom left is where a third of the covers uh, in place and we've got um, operating the gas production and the completed cover bottom right. And that's 